So that's a great pleasure today to host uh, Professor Zhao Ping Li uh, for the last seminar of this academic year. So a few words about uh, Zhao Ping. Uh, she was initially trained in physics in China, and she obtained a PhD also in physics uh, from Caltech. Uh, then she was faculty member in uh, computer science in uh, various places. She's a founding member of the uh, Gatsby Computational Neuroscience Unit at UCL in uh, 1998. So this uh, great unit that um, has for many uh, great researchers and uh, is at the origin of uh, many interesting pieces of work. Uh, three years ago, she settled at the University of Tübingen. Uh, she has done a lot of work on uh, sensory processing, in particular vision and olfaction. Uh, she has put forward the concept of a silency map. And uh, today she's going to present some work about visual processing, uh, attention and uh, feedback and uh, feed forward connections in the brain. Thank you very much for being uh, for the talk today. Thank you very much for inviting me uh, to, to meet uh, all of you. It really is a, a big honor to be uh, having this opportunity to discuss with you because you come from different kind of background and all of these topics, a lot of you are ex expert on it. I would love to have uh, discussions and feedbacks during and after the talk. And, uh, and also uh, this uh, touches both the low level and high level. So there's a uh, different aspects. So love to hear from you. So anyway, this is a very busy slides, but anyway, we are gonna dissect them little by little. So the top title is from v VISH to CPD, which means from the V1 salient cell hypothesis to the central peripheral dichotomy. And so the idea is motivated by that we have an attentional bottleneck, which is in the brain, but in particular, in this case, is in vision. And because of that, we have information all coming, massive information, and then we have to select. And of course, it's half a century of uh, argument of selection, early selection, later selection. These arguments have been going on in behavioral psychology, but now we are having the ability to go into the neural level. And, uh, and so whether it's very early or very late has a huge impact on what vision is. And wherever you do start to select, then after the selection, the fee forward will be less information than before the selection. And when you have less information fee forward, you will have to sometimes feedback for information query or prediction or inference. And this is more or less the idea. And what if selection starts right in V1, then the whole consequence will be very different if the selection starts, let's say in IT, yeah, and so, do you, is that really a, a, a wild guess that selection in V1 or is there some kind of a um, uh, actually evidence? So that's the idea. And so therefore he is, hmm, why is this not, not doing my, uh, hmm, that's strange. Somehow it's not doing my, anyway. So, that, so the idea is I'm gonna uh, motivate it. So why do we have need this framework? So the question is what is the previous framework? Hmm, I do not understand why this is not doing proper. Hmm. I'm sorry, do, I need to just stop this, maybe redo it uh, to, to, to see somehow the animation is not working. So, okay, let's just do it this way. Okay, V1 CDNC hypothesis and central peripheral dichotomy in this framework. And therefore uh, the plan is we are going to motivate this new framework. And then you say, what is the, previous framework, why should we change it, yeah? And uh, so when we ask what's the previous framework, actually we're asking ourselves, what is vision? And so in a sense, you can also ask yourself, what are the previous theories of vision? And people usually need to think about it. The fact that one has to think about it uh, actually means vision is quite kind of a sparse or poor or lacking in, in this field. And so therefore um, one need to ask this question. And so let's look at the traditional framework. In fact, there is a framework. One of the framework is uh, look for feature detectors, yeah? And so this started with, you know, putting electrodes uh, in various brain regions and put stimulus on the screen to see what drives it and starts more than half a century ago with uh, uh, discovering that in, v, uh, in retina, you have 
this uh, center surround kind of feature, you can call it dot feature, okay? Black dot, white dot, red dot, green dot, and all these kind of dot features. And, and different neurons are driven by different dots and different locations will tie up the whole visual field, uh, individual neurons. And that's great. And then you can carry on with the same paradigm. In fact, they were from the same lab and say, what, what about V1, the next stage? You can also, of course, do the LGN so on. And then they find that, okay, in V1, something else is driving neurons. They are no longer dots, they are bars. You can imagine bars are each, each is two dots, two dots form a bar. So therefore one dot become two dots, okay? So red bar, green bar, vertical bar, horizontal. Again, different neurons uh, uh, preferred features tie the whole visual field and that's wonderful. And we all know that's very successful. So imagine you enter the field at that time, that's more than half a century ago. Say, wow, you know, these people did, did it such great progress. In fact, also inspired theory and all this in 10 years. So I say, okay, let's do it next. Okay, and then you, you, you want to do it next. And that's, we can do V2, V3, V4. And indeed, a lot has happened. However, more than half a century later, Hubert Weasel, thought that we haven't really done much as far as they're concerned. I think it's a bit too harsh, but nevertheless, in a sense that they did set up a great progress and expectation in a sense that we did do a lot, but maybe not as much as what's expected from their big progress. So therefore one may ask the question, why, what happened, right? You know, maybe are we asking the wrong questions? Somehow V1 become the persistent frontier from which the progress later on becomes slower, what's the reason? And say, if we ask the wrong question, what's the right question? And people usually say, okay, how about, you know, feature detector is one particular framework, let's ask another framework, low level, mid level, high level vision. Now, what's wrong with that? Well, this is actually not falsifiable because everything is low. And also the reason it's not falsifiable is because it's not precise enough. You cannot quite say it's right or wrong. So as a theoretical approach, you have to say, what, you know, can you tell me some prediction that can prove it wrong or right, yeah? And of course, people can put themselves out of spot and say, hey, I could be more precise and make it falsifiable. That's what David Ma did. But again, that's kind of a, you know, long time ago and uh, still not having as much uh, success as we would hope. Otherwise, Hubert Weasel wouldn't have pronounced this in 2012. And so what's the tr uh, trouble? What's the problem is, in my opinion, there is this elephant in the room, which is attentional bottleneck and uh, is being um, ignored. And you no, know, we have strong evidence we are nearly blind. Yeah, if you look at these two pictures, uh, usually if you have look, never seen it before, you could not tell the difference between these two pictures, even though the difference is huge. So this is one data point showing that we are blind and the attentional bottleneck. The difference is in this uh, airplane engine, yeah? And in this sense that, you know, either we knew it, but it's maybe from a psychological point of view and neuroscience is less paying attention, or it's just something that it's such an unknown unknown that we did not realize it's such an important problem. And so therefore, if we really acknowledge this elephant in the room, we do need a new elephant because, you know, uh, uh, that's the idea. And so what if, now this a new frame where you not only just uh, take the visual input and encode it by your receptor field, by V1, by retina, whatever, but you don't just decode it, you have to select. And this is the attentional bottleneck you have to select. And what if this, you know, this selection, uh, well, in fact, the selection has been measured, how much is the selection is, you know, more than half a century ago, that's only 40 bits per second, even though you're coming in like, about one megabytes per second after uh, data compression. But somehow this elephant, so therefore this elephant in the room was known more than half a century ago. And the question is, what if this elephant starts right in V1? That might explain why in V2, V3, V4, we could not make as much progress because selection started. Something dramatically changed, yeah? And so therefore you, you know, flood of information start trickling down to V2, V3, V4, it will be very difficult for you to measure as the fields if information is not passing through. Remember, if we measure as the fields, you have to do this reverse correlation and all these kind of things. If information was not passing through, it will be difficult. And sometimes you may have to go feedback and just to say, hey, it's not enough information. Could I, you know, get more, something like that. And so therefore this is the framework. And then you say, well, that's quite a, uh, dramatic uh, uh, claim that it starts in 
in B1. So therefore, let's see, is that really making any sense? But if it does start in one, the whole thing have to think slightly differently. And the central proof dichotomy is if it indeed starts from B1, whatever selected is put in the central visual field, that means central vision is within the attentional spotlight and, and peripheral vision is different. So there should be selected versus non-selected or selected versus less selected, more selected versus lesser. There should be a qualitative difference and that's motivating the central peripheral dichotomy. And so, and therefore you will have a fee for feedback. So let's first of all, look at the framework. Okay, imagine that you have this, uh, um, you know, 20 frames per second. And because we have like more than 1 million photoreceptors, so it's got 1 million pixels on your digital camera will be uh, one megabytes per image, something like that. So 20 frames will be 20 megabytes per image. That's quite a lot. How much is 20 megabytes? 20 books, okay? You cannot read 20 books in one second. What can you do? You say, well, wait a minute, you can compress it. Yes, that's exactly what retina does. Now, after the compression, it's one megabyte, yeah? And you still cannot read it in one second. How much can you read? Not even one page is how much can you read? About two sentences, this is roughly it. And so that's all of magnitude calculation can do that. As I said, it's in, in fact has been measured uh, uh, in more than half a century ago by engineers uh, when actually psychologists and engineers, when uh, information theory was very uh, popular. So everybody's measuring these. Uh, channel capacities of, you know, telephones and an and, and attentional bottleneck in the brain. In fact, it's 40 bits is a lot. 40 bits is about 10 digits uh, telephone number. If you want to remember, it's it's 40 bits. So therefore, 10 digit telephone per second, it's actually not that little, okay? However, compared to the whole book, it's quite a lot, okay? But nevertheless, it has been measured. And how do we choose in the book the two most important sentences to read. You know, you say, okay, I'm gonna choose, uh, you know, read the whole book and see what's most important. You don't have the capacity to read it. So therefore you're more or less trying to have the egg without a chicken. And in fact, these two sentences better be very important for your survival. Otherwise you might be eaten up by a tiger in the forest and so on. So we choose them by gaze shifts. And so we, it's, it's, it's like this, okay? Uh, you, you shift to here, you say, hey, that's David and Henry and you know, John and so on that. And then you choose these two sentences, then you read it and say, what is it? Oh, it's the face of somebody, yeah? And so in a sense, a selection is like envision your look. You have to look, okay? Your gaze shift look. As, uh, and then once you look, then you see, yeah? And that's the idea. And in particular, this is how we look. You maybe first gaze, maybe fix it on here. You say you read these two sentences, say, okay, pair of shoes. Then you're the next gaze, they say, okay, David, or then John, and so on. So this is how you pick of the whole book, two sentences and two sentences, this is the selection. And uh, before, let's say, if your gaze is here, and before you go there, you choose to go there. But in fact, before you go there, this is in your peripheral visual field. So it's your peripheral vision tells you to go to the right rather than to the left. So choosing where to look is done by peripheral vision, okay? Now, once you chose it, you put it in your central visual field. You go there, your gaze go there, then the seeing is central visual field. So that's the beginning stage of central peripheral dichotomy because the looking and seeing is like that. And then therefore, after, if, you know, we say that choosing this start at V1. So at V1, it's about one megabytes per second. By the end, you know, when people start reporting, maybe frontal, you know, executive, 40 bits per second. Then you can say, gee, is this going slowly, <laughs> gradually, or suddenly? That's an empirical question one can ask. Okay, one megabytes per second V1. Now by V2, is it half megabytes or 0 0.1 megabytes? You know, if it's a half, it's a dramatic thing and 0 0.1, even more dramatic thing. But eventually you have to go to 40 bits, yeah? And so therefore you can use this to formulate the next question to ask, yeah? And so let's say, okay, this is again, we need to say, wait a minute, let's just, is it really true, yeah? And so let's look at visual selection. People have been working on this, you know, for, cent for, 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 for decades, yeah? So usually this gets selection, you know, let's say you have actually both top down and bottom up select. So top down, let's say you have a task, you say, hey, your task is to find a uniquely oriented bar, let's say in this image, and that will automatically make you look at this uniquely, not automatically, okay, your top down is not automatic, it's it's endogenous. You, you voluntarily want to look there. However, 
All of you have seen this red bar, yeah? This red bar, even though you may not have seen the airplane engine in the other image, the red bar automatically make you look at it. So, and, and by the way, top down usually is like a frontal and parietal thing. So who is making you look at the, this thing without even I point it out to you? So in visual search tasks, often people first can't go there, even though the top down task is supposed to go there, yeah? And so, there is an involuntary reflexive bottom up thing. And this may be in human, maybe not so obvious, but in lower animals, this is just basic, you know, like a robotic instinct. And in fact, they have to dominantly override your top down in order to protect your life from, from suddenly your dog jump into you or tiger jumps at you. And so therefore, uh, you, you could ask yourself, you know, okay, at least in humans, whether top down or bottom up is more important, maybe in lower animal bottom up is more important. And this is something there's many different opinions about it. And so, but for the moment, uh, let's say focus on button up. Okay. And this is like, a, you can say for the, for the focusing idealized case, button up. And so this has been around for cent uh, decades. People imagine that visual input comes in with a saliency map that focus on the bottom up. This is a psychological concept that's existing for quite many decades. And where is it in the brain is then the uh, linking to the neuroscience and it has been uh, around. People think that it should be also in parietal and frontal and so on. And the reason is saliency seem to be a generic thing. Okay, anything could be salient, whether it's orientation, color or motion. So therefore it's kind of all purpose generic thing. Therefore it should not be in the brain area where neurons are so specifically tuned to orientation or color and so on. So you therefore you need to find a brain area that has a map of the visual world, but the neurons are not tuned to specific features. So therefore it does make sense to think about parietal and frontal being where the saliency map is. Yeah. However, you can imagine that I'm going to say it's actually in B1. Okay, so that's the uh, so why is it? Uh, well, so this is my equation, okay? My equation of the saliency map is a behavioral uh, psychological entity and the V1 firing rate is a physiological entity and the equal sign is my hypothesis. So this is the V1 saliency hypothesis that this behavioral psychological quantity equal to this physiological quantity. And you can notice that in fact, V1 project to superior clitoris, which is the area where you need to control your your eye movement, okay? Superior clitoris project to brain stain, which then go to so all kinds of things, eventually move your eye muscle. So therefore, this thing going on for several decades, we know the anatomical projection is there. So therefore, this can be seen, can be read out by some executive secretary, which is which will read it out and do your uh, eye movement, okay? And of course, in V1, we know it's written topic map where any location in, uh, in visual field is sampled by many overlapping recessive fields. So in this input, you could say, okay, somehow this vertical bar is exciting this neuron a lot. But at this location, there could be another neuron tuned to red. And in, in this input, it could be the red neuron that exciting that location. In this input could be the neuron tuned to this particular motion direction exciting that location. But as far as superior critical is concerned, it doesn't matter, okay? Superior critical, by the way, has a retinotopic map and neurons in superior critical, at least in primates, but not in lower vertebrates. In primates, superior critical neurons are not tuned to features, but they can count your spikes from V1, okay? So that's the idea. Neural activities are universal currency that can be counted by superior calicris in this kind of a uh, cartoon metaphor, which I use to kind of motivate thinking outside a traditional uh, box. The idea is imagine you have an auction shop. It has a slogan that says attention auctioned here or my, your ga you know, gaze shift is auctioned here. Your gaze is auctioned here. No discrimination between your feature preferences and only spikes count. And so the idea is maybe one V1 neuron comes in, it's tuned to motion direction and pays one spike of money, another V1 you want to turn to color, pays three spikes of money, and another V1 you want to turn to orientation, pays two spikes of money. And this auctioneer maybe is the super curriculum and they say, hey, who cares, you know, whether you are from the, you know, male or female, religious or not religious, old or young, and all I care is your money. Yeah. And so uh, whoever pays most of neurofinery gets my gaze shift. And so that's the idea. And so with this, then you don't have to go, go wait until frontal parietal where the neurons are not tuned to features. You just say, 
uh, in V1, you can already do it. So that's a very economical approach in the sense that you don't have to wait, okay? So that's the cheap, immediate and bottom up selection where you have to have these reflexive and, and emergency behavior it needs to be quick. And so that, that's a, a good uh, point for V1 to start. But then, okay, that's a good point. And how, how is it done? In V1, you have all these neurons tuned to orientation. And here is a visualization of orientation columns with color visualizing the preferred orientation. So blue patches underlying neural cluster prefer vertical and red in the horizontal and so on. And superposed under the, is, is a, this black thing is really a parameter cell, okay? You can see this parameter cell cell body is in this blue patch. That means this, this cell is preferring vertical. And you can see it's sending a lot of these exon collaterals and they, they preferentially target other blue patches. That means this parameter cell is talking to other neurons also tuned to vertical. Now notice this is 500 microns. That means this is roughly about two to three, uh, three millimeters. So th this can extend to you know two to three, actually in monkeys about two to five, four millimeters. So that's two or four hypercolors away. That means it's contacting neurons even uh, rest of the field not overlapping. And so this is content neuron preferring the same orientation and as if you're not overlapping or things like that. And this is called, this is, they're actually exerting isofeature suppression. The idea is if you're tuned to vertical, I'm also tuned to vertical, then these two neurons suppress each other. So this is like to like suppression. And so if you tune to horizontal, I'm tuned to horizontal, suppress each other, okay? And that's how all these horizontal tuned neurons have mutually suppressed activities. And this vertically tuned neuron is not suppressed because neighboring neurons tuned to vertical are not being activated by visual inputs. And that's how this, this works. And then this can then be read out. And in fact, this has been seen, these kind of a, uh, phenomena has been seen since 1970s, but it was kind of a thing like a nuisance. So uh, yeah, anyway, imagine you're recording from this neuron and this neuron is firing a lot and keep your electro onto this neuron and these horizontal bars are outside the rest of the field and you suddenly turn them into vertical. Then you're continually recording from this neuron and suddenly this neuron is firing less, same neuron, okay? And this a lot and less can change up to 80%. So it's not a small approximation, it's a huge difference. And this is in, was observed since 1970s. And this huge difference is, is more or less uh, questioning uh, what is the classical risk of fields, right? And of course, classically, you, you do these kind of stimulus where it's a blank screen, and then you say, hey, this neuron is activated by vertical. If I make it horizontal, this neuron is less active. So you get horizontal orientation tuning. But you can see that this really is suddenly firing at all, firing less, firing wrong. What is it? Salient, not salient, salient. So even though this observation may be very messy and nuisance for the classical risk of field, it is exactly what we need for a saliency map because it's firing less only when it's not salient. Okay, it's firing a lot when it's salient, firing a lot when it's salient. And so, so that, that makes sense. But then you say, wait a minute, but, you know, V1 neurons are not tuned to faces, you know, faces are also salient, I can attract it to faces. Well, you don't need V1 neurons tuned to faces. Just imagine, okay, here is a situation where you have a cross among bars, it's also salient, yeah? You say, oh, this cross attracts your atten my attention. However, the cross V1 neurons, not, we, as far as we classically know, no V1 neuron tuned to crosses. You don't need a neuron tuned to cross. All you need is a neuron tuned to horizontal, certainly joins in. Now this horizontally tuned neuron get activated. And so that's all you need, yeah? So therefore in principle, maybe V1 is not a substrate for attracting attention to face, but that uh, not having V1 neuron tuned to face is not a good argument to say that you have to have neurons tuned to face in order to have V1 being uh, responsible for faces attract attention, yeah? And so these things, you know, just so that, uh, that, that, because when I was first thinking about that, I myself didn't even believe it. So I have to make a model just to convince myself. And anyway, I put in much more complicated things in my model and then it all worked. Uh, even though it's kind of a toy model, but first of all, I need to convince myself. But anyway, turns out this isofeature suppression is not just between orientation, it also between color. So you can have two neurons tuned to the same red color or same blue color. They also suppress each other. So therefore, uh, these you know, isocolor suppression is seen in, for instance, in Vatra et al. 2001, 2003. 
and isomotion direction suppression, that means neurons tune to same motion direction suppress each other, let's say in June at all 2001. And so therefore, you can also make uniquely red neuron can also excite, a uniquely moving neuron can also excite, yeah? Because here you may have a 1,000 or 100 neuron for the same phase, same location, yeah? And so forth. Uh, uh, so therefore you can have that, not a problem. So this gives ISO orientation suppression, this gives ISO color suppression, this gives ISO motion direction suppression. So this all makes sense. However, this only explains the past psychological data we already know. So you cannot say these are predictions, these are postdictions that you explain previously existing data. But now we have this uh, hypothesis, can you explain something that was not seen before? So let's try it, okay? Orientation, color, motion. <clears throat> what else in V1? Well, we predict something that it's surprising. Mm. Something invisible attract your attention. Yeah? Something invisible to perception, something invisible to awareness attract your attention. What is it? In V1, you have a signature which is ocular dominance. And this ocular dominance is not available in V2, V3, V4. By V2, V3, V4, all neurons are tuned to, not tuned to, I have origin anymore. Well, they're all binocular neurons. However, imagine you make people look at this picture and you ask them to do a task, say, look for a uniquely oriented bar and press button as soon as possible when you find it, yeah? And however, you make them wear 3D goggles such that you put the picture only in one eye and nothing in the other eye. If they don't blink, they, they wouldn't know. They think they both eyes see it and this is their fuse perception. They will find this bar press button in half a second, no problem. Now imagine you put a non-target bar in the other eye. You know, as far as observers are concerned, they didn't know that suddenly a non-target bar in another child. That's in another child. One child, all bars in one eye, another child, uh, there's a non-target bar in the other eye. They, they didn't know, okay? Now, V1 thinks that there's two bars unique. One is unique in orientation, another unique in ori uh, eye of origin. Turns out you also have I have origin suppression because you will have iso orientation suppression, I color, iso motion. You also have that. Well, that means this bar is activating the right eye tuned neuron, and all these bars are activating left eye, eye tuned neuron. So these bars are suppressing each other, but this bar, nobody is suppressing it. So this bar will also be firing a lot, just like this bar. So if your task is to find this bar, that bar is competing with you for attention, you'll be distracted. Yeah. So that's the idea. So if this theory is correct, you are going to have a very absurd prediction that something invisible will make you distract your attention. And turns out that's the case, even though it's so absurd, that's the case. In three out of four trials in my experiment where, where these are actually on a two different lateral sides, more than 10 degrees away from the center, three out of four trials, the first gaze shift is to this task irrelevant bar an observer didn't even know that. And it's a fingerprint of V1 because this information is no longer available V2. In fact, this is another example showing that after V1, some information is lost. So remember earlier I was advocating that V1 starting, you know, bottleneck, attentional bottleneck may start in V1, yeah, uh, after V1. And so I have origin information is lost. So this is one part of the information is lost. Uh, anyway, uh, this is also an example that indeed egg comes before chicken. And, uh, so you're looking, you have to find these two sentences before you, you read it. Yeah? And so in a sense that observer did not know what it made them look at. It's, it's, in fact, you can do the same ex experiment, uh, same, uh, use the same uh, visual stimulus, but make people not to look for a uniquely only bar. You ask them to look for, you know, just tell me if there are any bar in a different eye, they could not do this task. So it's as if they just hit, they did a motor action, move your gaze to it without realizing there's something there. So this is how looking happened without seeing. And because it's so, uh, counterintuitive, this thing is easily uh, replicated and has been replicated in many uh, labs. And later on, uh, I'm, I collaborate with my uh, collaborator Wu Li uh, to, to look this further. Uh, in monkeys, they, they fixate in center and uh, then uh, these bars appear. The monkey have to find a uniquely oriented bar. It could be here, it could be there. It uh, could be different location, but sometimes it's where you're recording. And this is the time since the bars onset. This is the stimulus. Uh, this is the V1 responses. And so sometimes mon monkey's task is to find this bar and suck up to as soon as possible, as soon as possible. Okay, they don't have to wait, delay, nothing. And uh, 
And turns out that among these trials that they succumb faster or able to succumb, V1 response is higher. And this happens so early that it's quite unlikely this signal comes from frontal, parietal, or, or even superior colicus. So, and of course, monkey saccade usually is 200 milliseconds later. So this is predictive of later. You can imagine this V1 neurons fluctuation for the same visual input. By the way, these are for the same visual input, just repeated 30 trials, interleave with many, many other trials where the target is in a very different location. Uh, it's like that, yeah. And so that's another uh, strong indication. And so now if we do believe on, uh, let's say we can also play the theoretical game that in, if indeed selection starts in V1, even though V1 is perhaps one of the team members of a whole team do the selection, but if it's one of the team members and the team may include front of eye field and other things, but something already started V1, then what happened? Okay, and so that motivates of thinking, okay, Periphery, you start where to look, and now we let's look at the seeing and the seeing. Okay, we know central vision, peripheral vision. We have a different kind of a uh, visual acuity. You know, the acuity is much higher uh, in the center. However, in addition to acuity, we also have crowding. So imagine you look at this picture and you fix it on a cross, and you can actually see the letter T, even though the acuity here is less than in the fovea. It's enough for you to see letter T, yeah. However, if you fix it here, uh, this letter T you just can't see very well because it's crowded. And so therefore, in addition to acuity, something is there. It's called crowding. This is something not because your uh, 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 retina doesn't have acuity. Something is in your brain. It's preventing you see it, okay? And so, so imagine you have a lot of V4 information comes come to V1 and then starting from V2, some information already trickling down and then you need to get more information, okay? Feedback need to query. And this query should be only in central vision because by then V1 make, let's say V1 already make you shift your gaze and put whatever you need to look and say, hey, I don't want to just look in peripheral. I want to shift my gaze, look at it, okay? And then your gaze is here. And so therefore feedback, if your brain is having limited resources, it doesn't have enough room for so many feedback cables, then put it only in central vision. That's economic, okay? So that's the idea. So in particular, it means V1, uh, retina, all these flood of information comes in. Imagine V1 already made you shift your gaze and put this object into the center of visual field. You have already shifted your gaze, put it there, okay? And then I'm using these metaphorological uh, <laughs> graphics to indicate that information is starting to be lost. Information bottleneck starts. And I just delete some pixels. Of course, exactly how the brain does it, it's not deleting pixels, but this is just a metaphor. Such that, uh, you know, as I said, example information loss starting from V1, I have origin information is lost, such that we don't know which I see is what input, yeah? And we also have a lot of spatial details with the fields uh, are getting lost. For instance, complex cell versus simple cell. In fact, complex cell has already information lost versus simple cell because complex cell is invariant to exact location of the bars within the field. So some information is lost. But anyway, this loss is even in a central visual field, okay? Such that, okay, in a central visual field, you say, what is that? Is that a a leopard or is it a flower? Okay, you, you can't see very clearly. And then you'll say, okay, now if it's flower, it should look like this. It should, if it's leopard, it should look like that. So you can query for specific information because by then you already narrow it out. You're not gonna say this is going to be a mountain, yeah? Because mountain probably doesn't look like that. But you say, okay, how about narrow down two choice, flower or leopard? And then you, in your brain, you have a model of the world. A flower should look like this and leopard should look like that. And so query say, just tell me the distinctive feature between flower and leopard. I only query for a specific small piece of information. This you can do in a narrow bottleneck, okay? And so that's the query for more information. However, and because this query has your internal model, what rapper should look, leopard should look, flower, so therefore you will introduce bias. This bias coming from your internal thing. And, and this is something uh, we, we did by ambiguous perception and we find this bias to be stronger in central vision. And that was the motivation to, for me to propose that as a central peripheral dichotomy. So the idea is peripheral vision, you only have feed forward, you don't have the feedback query. Now, what can you do? Okay, feedback is, I don't have the feedback. You look at this, what is this? Say, oh, this looks like a stick figure with the arm here, arm here, head here, you know. <laughs> okay, you you can't you don't have the cable. Go back to hey, give me more information of the stiff figure. Therefore, you are not you have to believe it, and therefore you are going to have illusions. Yeah, 
So let's have some fun, okay? Illusions. We can use illusions as a way to probe our central peripheral dichotomy. Do you see illusions here? You see lots of flashing dots in here, and these flashing dots are such that uh, somehow, where, whenever you look at it, it's not flashing. Yeah, they look. You can even give cats look at it. The cats will jump on it too. So, so yeah, cats have these illusions too. So this shows that in central vision, it's not flashing, but it's only flashing in the corner outside. So this is a peripheral illusion. Yeah. Here's another example. Things are rotating. Yeah. But somehow, wherever you look, it's not rotating. It's only rotating in the peripheral vision, yeah? And so these are examples. And if you look, go back and all these treasure in our field with all these uh, 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 illusions, you can see a lot of them are in fact, uh, these, uh, 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 these in the peripheral. But some visual phenomena actually happen in central vision. And by this framework, you say, okay, they must be involving top-down feedback. Okay, and if you go down, they do involve top down feedback. Great. If not, you can falsify this central peripheral dichotomy. So, therefore, central peripheral dichotomy is falsifiable, perhaps using these illusions. But anyway, understanding that, let's create our own illusion. Okay, so here is an illusion that's with this understanding, you know, uh, we're going to do it. It's called flip tilt illusion. Now, here you have lots of uh, vertically aligned things. This is nothing illusion here. Indeed, they're vertical. Okay, so this is. Uh, Vertical. Uh, I call them homo pairs because in each it's it's each alignment is by a pair of dots. They're either both both black or both white. No problem. And here is hetero pairs. That's each pair is pair black dot and white dot. They're also vertical. Not a problem. Okay. But they're only vertical when you look at central vision. Now, if you put your gaze here and look at that, it will appear horizontal. In fact, I've tried with my uh, group members, almost 100%, they will say it's horizontal, first choice. However, in one trial, you are not, it's not easy to convince because they say, I don't know, but we only when we make the first choice, they say horizontal. But anyway, with, without this, I'm going to give you a demo to, to show you. So if you look at this, okay, you can fix it here on the central cross. Do you see a big ring? Yeah, uh, that big, big ring is not illusion, okay? It's indeed there. It's made of all these homo pairs, they are all lined up with tangent of the of the ring and many other noise homo pairs. Okay, there's no illusion here. This is just a baseline condition. And now I give you a test condition where uh, this image is the same as that image, except on the ring, uh, every second pair is a header pair, and it's also tangential. Okay. Now remember, I told you that these kind of a header pair pairs, they will look perpendicular to it, okay? And that's why you just can't see the ring anymore, yeah? You fix it here and somehow you can't see the ring. Is that true? Yeah, yeah, you just can't see the ring anymore. They say, okay, wait a minute. Uh, you say uh, these, just because these appear perpendicular, but how about if I actually make them perpendicular, then they should appear parallel, yeah? In, now, if you fix it here, the ring is in your peripheral visual field, okay? So if you fix it here and I put this, perpendicular, now by illusion, it should appear parallel, then you should see the ring again. Shall we try that? Okay, let's try that. And that's exactly what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna use the third picture and I make it non-perpendicular, okay? Now the illusion says they should become parallel, okay? And now you fix it here, okay? These two pictures are exactly the same except for these pedal pairs. One is perpendicular, one is parallel. And take them away, you try it. Which one, uh, can you see the ring easier? Now, most people think they can see ring easy here versus there. Is that true for you? Yeah. And so that's a demo showing that indeed, here's an illusion. Now let's understand how this illusion comes about. Okay. So in V1, you have recitative field. This is all classical Hubble weasel. Let's say you have a horizontally tuned recitative field. There's an on, on field and off field. And if you put two dots on it, which is a vertical pair of dots, it will excite itself. That's why. Yeah. But you can say, wait a minute, and this may be exciting a cell. This can also excite cell. This can also excite cell. A Gabor can also excite cell. So all these kind of things can excite a cell. And But if you put this in a vertical pair, a vertical, a cell tuned to vertical, it doesn't excite a cell. Yeah, that, that's how it works. And so therefore, imagine in the retina, you have two dots are vertically aligned and excite a V1 cell. And then V1 then send this forward. Now imagine we have an extreme situation 
the bottleneck is so huge, you have 100 million neurons in V1, but the bottleneck is so huge, only this V1 neuron sent forward, nothing else sent forward, okay? So therefore, you don't have a population coding, you only have one V1 neuron sending forward this information. Okay, in higher brain center, they say, hey, this V1, let's call, let's call this V1 neuron Mary, okay? And Mary is firing, and this higher visual area say, okay, Mary could be firing because this retina input, that retina input, that retina input, that retina input. Which retina input, yeah? Or oh, it don't, don't know. So therefore, if it, if it doesn't know, it will say the majority voting say horizontal, so that's horizontal. Now, what if the higher visual center say, wait a minute, it's also possible that, okay? Let me verify, is it possible that? So send feedback, and I say, let me verify, is it really that? You know, if you verify, because by then it knows it could be this, could be this, could be this. Let me verify, realize, oh, you're telling me fib news. This is actually this, it's fake news. It's actually vertical. And then you will not be fooled. So therefore, central proof of dichotomy means that feedback can make you verify and you can, it signifies visual understanding because you understand that when Mary neuron fires, it could be that. That's the internal model of the world, okay? And so that's the idea. And uh, so this is the framework called feed forward, feedback, verify, reweight. So feed forward, feedback, and verify, reweight. And this framework is not mine. Okay, I'm just rephrasing it because this kind of, uh, you know, verify and, uh, um, you know, Helmholtz and many other people have been going on. I'm just putting it, a uh, paraphrasing it. But anyway, that's the way it goes. And uh, now what if you have a, a, a space-time oriented receptive field? You can even extend to motion, okay? You have a dot here at time, uh, T1 uh, location X1 and the time T2 uh, location X2, this dot moved to the right. Okay, so therefore uh, this neuron is tuned to rightward motion. That's a direction selective cell. But if you put this neuron move to the left, this cell would not be excited. So this neuron, however, if you make a black dot, okay, this is reverse fire motion and that's illusion. Okay, people do see that. Reverse fire illusion works like that. You just flip the uh, polarity, you see that, and uh, and therefore you will have this illusion. You know this is analogous uh, to that. I'm not gonna, uh, yeah. Anyway, uh, so now you can also rather than motion, you can do stereo because motion is like a, a input at time one, input at time two. Stereo is input at uh, left eye, input to the right eye. So therefore, if was, this is a random dot stereogram with a central disk in front of surrounding ring. It's made by having a random images that are identical to each other, random images. And the, by the way, the green circle is not there just for illustration. And then you shift the green circle of dots a little bit. This is disparity, okay? And this kind of a shift is making this disk in front. And this is analogous to this two dots, okay? You can, there's two dots just shifted to each other by the disparity, just like that. Now you can do another analogy, okay, which is that. So this is another random dot stereogram, exactly the same, except every black dot in one eye corresponds to a white dot in the other eye. Okay, so this analogy is that. And so this should give you V1 signals that's for the other. So that's indeed what happens. So for this normal random dot stereogram, you have V1 neurons tuned to disparity. Okay, so this is a disparity tune cell. Disparity versus firing rate has a preferred disparity around here, which says this is in front. Okay, this is a positive disparity says this is in front. Same neuron, if you give them these kind of a called anti correlated random dot stereogram, and it's disparity tuning curve flipped. That means this neuron will be suppressed. However, other neurons tuned to the opposite disparity will be excited. And so therefore V1 neuron is reporting to higher visual areas say this is not in front but behind, okay? And it has been known that humans cannot see this even though V1 neuron is reporting this reverse depth. Okay, in our framework, it's like this. V1 feed forward reverse depths to higher brain centers and higher brain centers say, hey, this is a bit ambiguous. Let me just feedback and just verify. And when I verify, I realize that, gee, you know, you are not really shifting in the right disparity uh, direction and the one dot black versus other dot black. White, it's, you are telling me fake news. So therefore V2, V1 report and a V2 in V1 report means that you don't perceive it. And that's the idea. So now we say that what if there is no such fee feedback verification? So anyway, top-down feedback in central vision enables vision not to be easily fooled, not to be easily having this illusion, fake news believing it. Now, however, 
if in peripheral vision you don't have this feedback, then you will just believe whatever the fake news V1 tells you. So therefore we predict that this reverse depth can be seen in peripheral vision. And this is recently tested. We ask observer to tell us false choice. Okay, they have to say whether it's in front or back, in front or back. Sometimes uh, uh, okay, in, in this in front or back, in front or back. And uh, in central vision, it's chance level performance. In peripheral vision, it's much worse than chance. That means they are telling you the opposite, yeah, reverse depth. This is really quite something. However, if you make them do it in a in this normal stereogram, whether it's central or peripheral, they can they can do it perfectly well. So this is actually a, a test of the central peripheral dichotomy, and we we see that. And now let's focus on this top down feedback. So, okay, we are really interested in top down feedback. So let's just look at central vision for this. And so in these kind of a stereogram, we 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 have a normal contrast matches random noise stereogram. And this is the on these you have you know contrast uh, anti so homo pairs for these disc and hetero pairs for this disc. So now let's just look in central vision and see the top down feedback. And we start with these kind of thing, and we are going to make uh, make these normal homo pairs to to the central disc. Okay, and make two more copies. And then this is construction. I'm constructing some stereogram. I want to investigate feedback. So I add then some header pairs to this. Now this header pair is exciting V1 cell, even though it's having the same disparity, but it, V1 cell is reporting reverse steps, but this is not. So therefore I call this incongruent random dot stereogram because V1 cells from these header pairs are saying opposite message as from these Homo pairs. Does that make sense? Yeah. So this is incongruent. On the other hand, I do the same here, but I'm gonna flip the disparity by 180 degrees. Now these hetero pairs in V1 are exciting the neuron the same way as these hetero pair or uh, homo pairs. So therefore, these are all consistent V1 signals. So I call that congruent random dots. Does that make sense? Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. And here, I just do a control with monocular dots. There are one, one dot in the left eye, one dot in the right eye, but they are not matched. They are just random, okay? And so therefore, I create these incongruent neutral and a congruent random stereogram. And we know that these kind of uh, things, hetero pair things, if they are purely 100% hetero pair, human cannot see these depths in central vision because of top down, okay? However, human can see these kind of depths because they are all homo pairs, a little bit noisy. Yeah, they can see it. Okay, they can still see the depths. And so the question is now you add some hetero pair, and these hetero pair are telling you the same message as these homo pairs. Would you make you see depths more clearer? And for this, make you see depths less clear. So I'm kind of adding a little bit of perturbation to see. Okay, and so is it clear or less clear? Okay, that's the question. So we, what we do is we say, is it clear or less clear? We, we're trying to measure the clarity of depth perception and making people, you know, if it could be the, the straw man is no effect. They have the same level of clarity, but it's also possible that people think this is more clear or that is less clear, okay? And so this is uh, the experiment that we, uh, uh, we can also add in a bit more noise just so that we're on this sweet spot where they're almost, uh, you know, kind of the prime equal to one, it's kind of ambiguous, so that, like that. But anyway, so that's what we do. We ask people, we give people two random dots still, right? could be one incongruent, one neutral, okay, or could be one neutral, one congruent, one or, or one congruent was incongruent, a pair of still, right? They have to tell us which one is clear, okay? And then if they're all 50-50, then is no effect. But if the probability of reporting the more congruent one is clear is more than the probability of reporting the less congruent one, then this difference, the probability difference we call preference. So we measure this preference. And this pre preference, we make people say, uh, you know, so, so, so for instance, in the example, when we show them this random score for only 0 0.02 second. Now, why do we 0 0.02? So it's 20 milliseconds. The hope, the hope is 20 milliseconds is too short for feedback to act. Okay, is it 20 millisecond? Gee, maybe it takes 30 or 40 milliseconds before feedback act. So 20 millisecond. 
And so the, the first trial, they say, okay, maybe one interval show this, one interval show that. They're gonna say, which interval is clear? And you find that indeed, when, they, when you give neutral versus incremental, they are more likely to say neutral is clear because you always get the difference in the probability of reporting. And when it's uh, congruent versus neutral, they always say congruent is more clear, okay? And with congruent with incongruent, was, no, not always, okay? This is the probability they say it's more clear. So 20% probability they say neutral is more clear, or less than 20%, okay, like 18 or 15%. But never it's significant, okay? Here, when you compare congruent versus incongruent, you can more than 30% probability, they say the congruence is more clear. So indeed, they, they have it. They have a perceptual effect. Okay, let's continue. Now we are going to show them 100 millisecond. Now 100 millisecond, maybe feedback start to act. We don't know, okay? Looks like it's still there, although this effect is getting weaker. Huh? But never it's still signal. Here, the rest star means it's significant. It's six subjects, okay? Still there. Okay, it's getting weaker. Okay, let's bring it longer. 200 milliseconds. By there, hopefully, <laughs> feedback really is acting, yeah? This disappeared. This is still there. This is still there. Okay, now remember, this is comparing congruent with incongruent. So that it has both the pro and anti effect. So reason this is dropping down is perhaps this is becoming weaker, yeah? Okay, let's say so one second, then really one second, this same pattern holds. So now what is this? This is congruent with neutral. So congruent is having V1 signal helping you, yeah? And so therefore, when the V1 signal is helping you, somehow feedback, even with feedback, this helping signal is, is trying to preserve that, yeah? Because remember congruent, you have the situation when, when you are congruent, this V1 fake news, the fake news from this is helping the real news, yeah? So therefore, the feedback just doesn't veto it. Huh? However, when the, uh, this is the, the bad news, bad fake news, you know, they are, they are kind of uh, incongruent. And then the anti effect is veto with sufficient feedback. And so that's amazing. And uh, so it's as if the top down feedback indeed is biased. And remember, top down feedback have your, your you know, you're, you're a little bit biased. And so the idea is we, we think of the, the so when you do not have enough time, okay, so let's go back. When you do not have enough time for feedback, then feed forward signal would, would influence your perception, okay? So feed forward signal, whether it's bad news or good news, or, you know, they just have it, okay? They just let the feed forward signal determine your, your thing. But when you have feedback, it's nonlinear, okay? It's discriminated. It's nonlinear constructiveness of the analysis by since the top-down feedback. It's a little like a, like a Kanita triangle, yeah? Can you triangle, you say, hey, there's a little bit of fee forward signal, okay, but there's no fee forward signal here. Yeah? A little bit of fee forward. So these fee forward signal are imperfect, but, the, but nevertheless, somehow you, you feedback and trying to construct it when it's, it's consistent what you want. Yeah? But when it's destroying you, you don't want it. And here is something else from Timo's work. It's a little bit, I'm trying to say, that hopefully, you know, this is still a behavioral thing. We do this behavioral thing because we understand the V1 V forward signal, but we still haven't done it in monkeys and stuff. I really want to know the the the, the monkey, uh, you know, exactly where in the brain. So I'm trying to see. So for instance, here, Timo's work in the monkeys. Monkey fixate here. They're supposed to saccade to the end points where it is a trace all the way back. Yeah, and so here's the rest of the field there, and then there's a delay, and then the monkey is supposed to saccade over there, but by then there's nothing there. So if the monkey goes that way. And so I wonder whether this is analogous or not analogous. Whether this is a working memory. So what do you think, Timo? So I just feel like, you know, we really need to nail down to the, to the neurons, right? Because these kind of paradigm, you also have these things that you know how the V1 respond to, to this uh, bar segment. But this paradigm also, you know how the V1 neurons are tuned to orientate, are tuned to disparities and so on. And now we have this kind of a, you know, this kind of a discriminative bias feedback and they, they have a signature. So for instance, here, here you have a signature of target versus distractor, okay? So by the way, these are the receptive field being measured and during the delay periods over here, you can see that this different response target versus distractor over here. So therefore somehow during this time, there is a feedback is somehow exciting these neurons. But I wonder, can you also, rather than target versus distractor, can you do 
you know, good news versus bad news kind of feedback. You see what I mean? <laughs> you know, would, would that also have a particular monkey work where I say, okay, because this is biased feedback. And so that's something I really love to hear from you guys. And uh, uh, yeah, and uh, I, I want to just uh, sum up basically, you know, this is this is a kind of a cartoon I try to use to, to talk about the whole picture that we see that, we think we see the whole world clearly, but in fact not, okay? We, we have all these one megabytes per second the image comes in, sent to V1, the V1 then create a saliency map. And this saliency map is creating the, you know, here's a hotspot, here's a second hotspot, the third hotspot and so on. And from the saliency, then uh, you, you guide your gaze shift, your gaze shift, put it there, and then the information further sent forward. But sent forward is already kind of less information and then only in the central visual field. On the periphery, you have kind of a smudged up thing. So where you can see stick figures and hallucinations, uh, not hallucinations, illusions of monsters or whatever you can want to see. But in central vision, you can say, hey, what is this? It's just a red apple or red rose. Then you can feedback and say, what is it? And then you have a you know kind of feedback and they say, oh, okay, it's a, it's a rose. While periphery, you are more uh, susceptible to, to illusions. And I love to see this kind of a, uh, and of course, this is a, uh, you have also other kind of selection that come from the frontal and here this is not completely put in, but we're trying to say that some selection already starting V1, and maybe this is why uh, um, we need to put this in light of investigation in V2, V3, V4, and therefore make progress beyond what Hubo Weasel originally did up to V1 and uh, previous people's work can be combined into, into this uh, uh, to, to, and it's also falsifiable because you say, hey, is it really the case? And we, we ask this question, yeah. And, and some of it is uh, this framework about encoding selection decoding is in my book. And uh, um, I have been supported and collaborating uh, with lots of uh, collaborators. Thank you very much. Yeah.